Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. And my guest today has spent her adult life writing about changing the world. Naomi Klein's new book is called On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal, but it's published 20 years after No Logo first put her on the map um, as a writer and a big thinker. Um, so, I mean, and this is obviously so right for our times. Uh, and at, at the time that we're recording this, London is still in the grip of Extinction Rebellion protests. Um, so paint as, a, paint as a picture of the world you would like to see. Sure. Well, it's wonderful to be with you and great to be able to, to talk about that, because I think it's probably the most important question that we should grapple with. Um, we should shake off the sense of inevitability that the world we have now is the only one we can ever have and that the only thing we can imagine about the future is just ourselves, only with um, sex robots or something like that. Um, so, yeah, the subtitle of the book is The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. Um, so the, the, the world that I would like to see is a world that was transformed by this idea of a global Green New Deal, which means that our, our policies would be guided by what climate scientists have been screaming at us for a very long time. A year ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a report that told us that we had 12 years to cut global emissions in half. Um, that's just 11 years, one year later. So that's the thing about time marches on, um, even if you're talking about Brexit all the time. And, um, and so we would, be, we would be doing that. We would be doing absolutely everything possible to decarbonize our economies in wealthy countries, um, the countries that kick-started the Industrial Revolution. We would have to move faster. So that decarbonized world, um, that process would be guided by justice. So what that would mean is that if we do have to change how we... Um, move ourselves around, our transportation systems, if we have to change our energy systems to get off fossil fuels, if we have to change our buildings to get off fossil fuels, if we have to change our agriculture system to get off fossil fuels, then why wouldn't we harness that huge industrial transformation to build a fairer society? Because we know that climate change isn't the only crisis we face. We face systemic racism, we face widening economic inequality, we face gender exclusion. So we need to multitask. So what that would mean concretely in this change world is that um, the communities that got the worst deal under the extractive economy based on fossil fuels that, that have the most polluted uh, air, the most polluted water, the most polluted schools, the, 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 the most neglected schools, would be the first to benefit from this transition. So they would get that, 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 that public investment. They would be able to own and control their own renewable energy projects, get the jobs from that. Um, the polluters would pay for this transition, so it wouldn't just be working people who would have to pay more for everything uh, to fight the climate crisis. Um, the workers who had to transition from high carbon sectors would democratically design their transitions. Um, they would be getting paid the same salaries, the same benefit levels, uh, the same unionized jobs, cleaning up many of the messes left behind um, by fossil fuel extraction, but also working in renewable energy, energy efficiency, public transit, all of these jobs that would be created. Um, and there would be a transfer of wealth from wealthy countries to poorer countries, closing that gap and actually making good on the debts that are owed from the north to the south, debts from colonialism, from slavery, um, and also uh, ecological debts because we've gobbled up all of the uh, um, atmospheric space to pollute. So yeah, I could go on and on about what the changed world would look like. Because <laughs> it's the, all I think about actually. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the Green New Deal is a mm -hmm. phrase that we hear well, we've heard in a couple of different contexts. Actually, in Britain, we heard it in a very sort of limited context under the coalition government um, between 2010 and 2015. Um, and they talked about a Green New Deal yeah. being sort of about, you know, new green jobs and mm -hmm. insulation and those sorts of things. In the current context, it's obviously about American politics and, um, you know, that, that sort of group of quite radical um, Democrat sort of contenders right. for the future. But actually, what you're describing is something much, much bigger. Well, the original New Deal was pretty big, too. So, so what, what's happening with the Green New Deal is that we're hearkening back to a time 
when the largest economy on the planet, the wealthiest country on earth, did manage to change itself very, very quickly. It, um, that, and that change was sparked by the Great Depression, but also an ecological crisis in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl. Um, so that wasn't the, the, the New Deal, the original New Deal wasn't just a couple of policies. It was a decade uh, under the presidency of Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt um, where you had the, the infrastructure of the United States changed dramatically, the, the built environment and also the natural environment. And the reason why I think it's important to remember that, um, or maybe it's another historical parallel that you want to uh, you know, think about, like the Marshall Plan or the ways in which societies changed during the Second World War uh, to free up resources for the, wa for the war effort. What I find when I talk to people about the climate crisis is that these days it is much less about denying the science, um, and it's tipped right into doom, doom, doomism. Like it's not denial; it's it's just the sense of doom. And when you when you ask people why do you feel it's inevitable, you know why do you feel there's nothing we can do, what you hear is is that people really feel that they're not capable, uh, that societies aren't capable of changing as quickly as the scientists are telling us we have to do. And, and we've heard so much that all we are is selfish, you know, that we can only make sort of decisions that are about just gratifying our individual selves. And so it's important to awaken a historical memory of times when even the most capitalist country on the planet um, was able to change itself very rapidly. But that, that is sort of the nub of it, isn't it? The, the, the question of capitalism. And you, you, you've written about it in the book, you know, about going to one of these, you know, right-wing um, sort of meetings uh, and people saying to you, well, isn't uh, environmentalism really just a Trojan horse for communism? You know, the, the sort of, the basic proposition of yours is is to blow up the world as we as we know it and to blow up capitalism you know and to stop well no, no. the basic <laughs> proposition of capitalism is to blow up the world um, you know if if we stay on the road we are on we don't have to do anything dramatic. We don't have to make a decision. There's no red button we need to push. If we just keep on keeping on, you know, get rid of the Extinction Rebellion so we can all get back to business as usual, you know, what climate scientists have told us is that business as usual, just continuing to do what we are already doing, leads to four to six degrees of warming. That is cataclysmic. We have warmed the planet by one degree, and we are already seeing these unprecedented storms. We are already seeing a massive coral die-off. We are already seeing the almost complete disappearance of Arctic sea ice. We are, we are seeing the great forests of our planet on fire. That's one degree of warming. What do you think four looks like? Let me tell you, it, you know, it's pretty dramatic. It does blow up the world. It's profitable for a handful of players along the way, but it is radical as hell. And so, yeah, I am saying we need to change that economic system. I, the, the changes that I'm describing I don't think should be called capitalist. That doesn't mean that there isn't a role for markets, but it does mean that we absolutely cannot leave the fate of our planet and the fate of our species in the hands of the market. They had a chance. Europe created its carbon market. We have marginal carbon taxes here and there. We have let the market come up with the technology for this crisis and it continues to be a worsening, deepening crisis. Capitalism can't fix this. So we're gonna need huge investments in the public sphere. And, and it, you know, if we wanna change how people live in cities, if we wanna decarbonize, then we have to do things like decide to make public transit free and better so people use it and want to use it and every and everybody has access to it there's no market solution for that uh, you know a mar the market can you know make some electric cars and sell them for high prices but it can't actually decarbonize our, our transportation system in a way that's going to be accessible to everybody there are a lot of people out there who think who are preparing for a world in which uh, climate change is real but which they but in which they preserve their position within that world and they try and keep out right. everybody else it's a genocidal logic it really is and that's in the book i call it climate barbarism i mean we saw a, we saw a headline in the paper yesterday um, about population movement um, you know, and about how Britain would have to um, change its, you know, its immigration rules because of climate change. Um, Absolutely. And we are, look, even if governments aren't saying it's because of climate change, I don't think it's a coincidence that we are seeing a very dramatic and rapid fortressing of 
the majority white countries and continents on this planet. You know, Australia, in a way, pioneered this model with offshoring detention facilities in privatized camps on Manus and Nauru, so that the idea is that the boats never reach Australia, right? And then that model, now that model has come to the, to, to the EU. And, and, and now it's about Libya intercepting the boats and bringing people to camps where people, you know, are, are, are under conditions that are tantamount to torture. I mean, on Manus and Nauru, people light themselves on fire because they are so desperate. Um, now Donald Trump's model, you know, a, a man who was elected promising to build a wall, right? I mean, he may deny the reality of climate change, but I don't think it's a coincidence that all of these figures, whether it's Trump or Salvini, um, you know, or even Bolsonaro, who, you know, they're fired up by this sort of sense of like scarcity, insecurity, we're gonna protect our own in this uncertain future. It's happening for a reason, and so, that it that is one way of adapting to the to the climate crisis. Yeah, build is, a big wall and cage children. That <laughs> and that and that's the model that is emerging, and that's not a notional future model. That is already the model that that we are seeing in Europe. We're seeing it in Australia now. Trump is trying to make deals with several Central American countries. Who, first, he cuts hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to Central America, including aid that was helping farmers to stay on their lands in the midst of drought. And he says to these governments, I'll give you money, but in order for you to cage these migrants and keep them from ever reaching the United States. So this is a new economic model for poor countries that it's being offered to them. Um, you can be the cagers for the migrants that we never want to reach our shores or, you know, our, or our lands. Um, and that is climate. That is a kind of climate change adaptation. But it is, it is, it is, it is one that will, that costs us our humanity. Um, it is one that resigns hundreds of millions of people to death and terrible suffering. Um, and there is another way. Uh, but that way requires that we invest in not just the infrastructure, the green infrastructure of you know public transit and and solar and wind. All that's good. We need to do all that. But we also need to invest in the infrastructure that allows us to live together without turning on each other. And this is the problem with austerity and the fact that our social services have been starved, right? Healthcare, mental health support, schools. So, I mean, this is what allows, that social infrastructure allows societies to be more resilient. And so when, when and, and, and we become more brittle when all, when all of that is starved. And so then when you have the additional stresses of more people, um, that's when we really, things get really ugly. You know, and I say in the book, I'm not just scared of things getting hotter and wetter, although that scares me. I've been in enough disaster zones to know how scary it is. But what scares me is how that extreme weather intersects with these ideologies that create a pyramid of which humans matter and which humans don't, the, that rank human life and says, well, these people count and those people do, don't, and these people are the insiders and those are the others, the outsiders, the invaders. When those forces intersect, that is when things get really, really scary. And that is not where we're headed. That's where we actually are. I talk about how we're, we have, we are in a time of three fires. We have the, the fires of climate disruption, we have the fires of hate that are turning people against each other that are connected to those fires. But there is another fire, and that is the fire of these huge social movements that are emerging to say, S wait a minute, um, this is madness. We, we actually have the ability to solve these crises and not turn on each other. And you know, even though it might block traffic and be a little inconvenient, I think it's a lifeline and we have to grab it. Well, well let's talk about those social movements. I mean, the, the, the quote on the back of your book is, is, is Greta Thunberg, and you've written about her, and you've, you've, you've dealt with her and met her. Um, a few times. What do you think is different about this movement, you know, other than it just being young people? Why do you think this movement's going to make a difference? Well, I don't think it is just young people. I, Extinction Rebellion is, is, is people of all ages. Um, and I think the difference is that people are getting that the climate crisis is not some far off issue to care about, you know, that we can constantly sort of defer and procrastinate while we focus on the things that are more important. 
um, we're in it. We're actually in it. And I think that, that the youth movement, there's a clarity to the way that this generation, that Greta Thunberg is a part of, but she's, there are many voices in this movement. Um, there's a clarity that young people are bringing where they're saying, we, you know, we are fighting for our lives. We are fighting for our future. We do not want to live in a world where we are spending our lives running from one disaster to the next, one shock to the, the next. You know, this, for, I've been on tour now for, for, for the better part of a month, and um, I did the tour in North America with the Sunrise Movement, which is a youth movement that has been calling for a Green New Deal that kind of famously occupied Nancy Pelosi's office after the midterm elections and demanded that they introduce a Green New Deal. They were visited by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So everywhere I go, there's a Sunrise hub, and I meet with the young activists before I do my events. Again and again, they ask me, do you think I can have kids? You know, I, I mean, this is what so many young women are asking me privately. You know, do you think it's fair to bring a child into the, the world? And what do you say? I mean, I say, I still think it's your body and your choice and nobody should tell you what to do with it. What I tell them honestly is that is that it's a fair question um, and that they need to support each other. Uh, um, and not try to struggle with us on their own. Well, why wouldn't you? Why would? Wh why wouldn't you? Wouldn't one? I mean, have, what they're you know, saying is that if they, at age nineteen or twenty, are afraid of their own f future, that uh, that they're just going to be buffeted by disasters and scarcity and violence, that having a child in a few years and that child would would live longer into this inhospitable future. Is that an ethical decision? But I say, look, kid, the children are coming. What, whether you decide to have a kid or you don't, people are going to have kids. So what we need to focus on is how we make sure there's a future in which it is possible for those kids to grow and thrive. And that is not the road we are on right now. But I suppose a lot of people in the developed world are ultimately going to be insulated from a lot of the worst effects. I've just come back from Mali making a documentary. There. Yeah. The effects of climate change in Mali are absolutely yeah. apparent right now. It's one of the drivers of the conflict right. there. Sure. So if a young person says to me, climate change is a disaster for me, I get that. Yeah. If a young person in New York says climate change is a disaster for me and I'm worried about my survival, I kind of think, well, you're probably going to be all right. Well, they, they, just because they're okay now doesn't mean they're going to be okay in 20 years from now. I mean, they're talking about whether or not to have a kid. There's no doubt that, that climate change discriminates. It is unequal, like everything else in our world. Um, and it is cruel because the people who did the least to create the crisis, like the people who I'm sure you filmed in Mali, who have a very low carbon footprint, because most people in Mali do, are on the front lines of it and, and getting the worst of it, which is why I said in the way I changed the world is there would be a transfer of wealth uh, because a huge amount of wealth has been extracted from these countries that are on the front lines of climate disruption. That said, I think it's an illusion that we are going to be okay in, in wealthy countries. I just came back from Paradise, California, which is a community, uh, um, a very lovely, was a very lovely community in Northern California. Um, nice homes nestled in the woods, um, and it, now it is a, a graveyard. Uh, it was the site, it was uh, uh, um, ravaged by the largest and most devastating fire in California's history almost a year ago. Uh, um, 14,000 buildings were destroyed, and, you know, things, they thought they were going to be okay too. So I think what we need to wrap our heads around is that the future is radical one way or another. We either face radical physical changes or we wrap our heads around the fact that we need radical political and economic change in order to avoid that future. But that, that, that's what's really interesting, I think, about your work, because you, you, what you're writing about is, is actually how you actually deliver systems of change, and that is through political change. The fire, that third fire you talked about, which Greta Thunberg's involved in and which Extinction Rebellion are involved in and all of these people, um, are about going out onto the streets. Um, and there's a, there's a sort of a disconnect there, isn't there? You know, that, that, that Greta can stand up and say, you can change the world by, by going, you know, missing school on Friday and going standing with a placard out in, in, in Parliament Square, when the truth is you can't. 
change the world through politics and political change and mm -hmm. having ideas and pursuing policy. And it's really difficult and detailed and sure. boring a lot of the time. And a year ago, a year ago, nobody was talking about a Green New Deal. But what, what, what happened was that a few people who never imagined that they would run for office decided to run for office in the United States and won in the midterm elections a year ago. Um, and the Democrats took control of the, over the House. Um, and rather than throwing a parade, a group of scrappy activists at, at, at the Sunrise Movement, many in their late teens, um, some even younger, went to Washington and occupied the office of the most powerful Democrat and didn't say, congratulations, you just won the election. Which they what said, she was expecting. what's <laughs> your plan? We want a Green New Deal. And then they were visited and supported by this group of, of insurgent newly elected Congress people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and, and Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and Ayanna Presley. These are not your traditional politicians. They have, they're tied to movements. And they said, this is what we should do. We need to listen to the scientists. And so they started uh, translating that demand from the streets into policy. And then it proved so popular that the majority of the people who are running to lead the Democratic Party and run against Donald Trump in the next election, like Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, they have all come out supporting the Green New Deal. Only Joe Biden, among the front runners, is not supporting the Green New Deal. But do you think they, re when they say they support the Green New Deal, do you think they really well, do? Well, I will answer <laughs> or, that or question. Do they think but the point is, is that you're saying Greta's just out there, you know, and Extinction Rebellion is, is blocking traffic. There is an ecosystem of activism, okay? Um, and there are some people who are in, who, who, who are just sounding the alarm. Um, but there are also people who are putting forward the plan and have been developing that plan. The Green New Deal comes from the climate justice movement. It actually comes from the global south. And I do think that Bernie Sanders really means it, and I think he has a long track record. I do think Elizabeth Warren really means it um, and has been meeting with a lot of activists to help her shape her plan. I have my own critiques of it. But, my God, this is a sea change. In this country, when you look at... I don't know how closely you've been following the Extinction Rebellion protests here and the images on the news and the disruption that's been going on in Westminster and in the city of London... What, what do you think of of the imagery of all of that? You know, because again, it's it's coming in for a lot of flack here. You know, a sort of uh, it's 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 lefties, it's crusties, it's it's people you know who just kind of it's it's the same old environmental movement kind of imagery, rather than something more sophisticated that mainstream Britain feels necessarily comfortable getting on board with. That's not, I mean, I'm not saying that's what everybody mm -hmm, thinks, but mm -hmm. that's, that's quite a big criticism from a lot of the country. You know, right. They go, well, you know, what, why, are they, why are they stopping people cycling down cycle lanes, down bridges? You know, uh, you know sure. that's just kind of stupid. Right. Um, do you think they've got the imagery right? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, there are, always, there are always missteps in any movement, right, where, where um, you, you know, obviously the image of a blocked cycling lane is, isn't a great idea. But I think that they've, they, they've helped redraw the political map. And I think a lot of people um, were feeling a tremendous amount of fear and dread. And they would read an article about, you know, an insect apocalypse or, uh, you know, a mi million species facing extinction or the loss of Arctic sea ice. And they would read it, you know, on their phone or, you know, read it in their morning paper and get really scared and then look around and Everywhere they, the, everywhere they look, people are just talking about Brexit. <laughs> and and they start to wonder, well, am I nuts? Like, is it just me that, that I actually think this is an emergency? I, I guess it's just me. And you just feel more and more isolated. Yeah. So I think what Extinction Rebellion has done and what I think is so important is they have just said, it's not just you. It really is an emergency, even if our politicians um, have their priorities absolutely backwards. You, you, your first reaction was right. And you don't have to just, you don't have to just deal with that alone, staring at a screen. You can be with other people um, and you can, you can deal with the fear and the grief and, and earn some hope too. I understand, you know, activism is messy. It's always a little cringy. You know, I'm a writer. This is why I write, you know, because I always get, I'm just, oh, can I just cling, can I just clutch my notebook, you know? But I'm not proud of that. You know, I understand it's, it's basically just my own sort of self-consciousness. 
I admire people who, who, who are able to, to just be in it with both feet because actually that's what this moment requires. But the truth is, I think a lot of people, and I would say these types of people are overrepresented in the media, including in the British media, um, aren't ideological in that way in terms of believing in a, in, in a set of sort of policies and worldview. But, they, but there is an ideology around centrism and seriousness and sort of not getting overly excited about anything, just being the type of person who sort of looks at the two extremes and says, can't we just find a middle ground, you know? Can we all just like take it a bit slow? And that's the way you prove your seriousness by, um, by not actually getting overly excited and, and differentiating yourself from the people who get excited. And so when you see people blocking traffic and saying, you know, the house is on fire, you know, you, you you want to attack yeah. those you, you people. You don't look at the house on fire, you look at the people blocking the traffic. Exactly. Yeah. Or as Greta says, you say, instead of saying, let's put the fire out, you go, what is she wearing? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that it's worth understanding that, you know, British identity is all about staying calm. Like, and that's, a, there's a, a, a lot of, there's there's a lot invested in that calmness. But, you know, if you are in a crisis, you actually do need to get a little bit worked up about it because if you don't, things aren't going to change. So I think we all need to kind of look at what it is about activism that is pushing our buttons. Um, and, you know, if, if we don't like it and we think it's too scruffy, then go show up in a business suit and make it a little less scruffy. I mean, it, it, it is who shows up is the truth. I mean, cult culturally, you're, you're from that tradition too, really, aren't you? Um, in Canada, although perhaps not personally. I mean, what, what was yeah, your... Yeah, no, I think that's where my cringe comes from about activism is I, I grew up, my parents were 60s radicals. Um, you know, my mom was part of the second wave feminist movement. My father, uh, we moved to Canada from the US because my father didn't want to go to Vietnam. They were both peace activists um, and are both sort of uh, you know, re were rebelling, particularly my mom, against her sort of 1950s repressive upbringing and was very exhibitionist. And I grew up in the 1980s and they were intensely embarrassing to me. So, um, you know, I, culturally, I get that, that activism is embarrassing because I spent my whole childhood just cringing at, at my parents. But I still, I, you know, th that, that doesn't mean that they didn't have a point. <laughs> and just because we may find some activism cringy doesn't mean we get to just tune it out because it aesthetically offends us. I mean, that's a terrible reason to let the world b burn. So did you reject <laughs> what they were on about as a teenager? You know, I, or? Yeah, like I didn't reject it and become right wing. I just sort of was just kind of like a, a fake blasé teenager of just like, just leave me alone and let me hang out with my friends. Um, and, um, you know, certainly was more concerned. I mean, I wrote about this in No Logo 20 years ago that I was sort of a, like the reason why I was interested in writing about brands was because I understood the allure of it. And I, I think I understood, like I grew up in a, a very, very sort of torn between my parents' values and and, and just how you know, marketing works on me. You know, it's, it's not like I'm wagging my finger and going, how could people be so stupid to want to buy these products? I mean, I want to buy them. Like, I get it. Um, but just because I want to buy it doesn't mean it's okay and we can all just shop ourselves to death. Like, we actually do still have to look at the implications of our actions. Why, why do you think... Um, I mean, Britain is, is, if anything, more fashion-obsessed and brand-obsessed than ever. Um, I've noticed that. And... <laughs> Despite you know this conversation having been going got, gone on for decades now, you know, um, and at the same time as we have this conversation about climate change and fast fashion, you know, the kids are out there every Saturday spending their money on cheap clothes. Some of them are, some of them are with Extinction Rebellion well, <laughs> and or, being or, or being called crusties. Are, yeah, well, um, yeah, but I mean, I think a lot of them are doing both. You know. Well, a, a lot of them are saying, are shouting about the climate, but they're also wearing nice clothes. Right. And I mean, some of them are saying, sure, I'm a hypocrite, but I'm inside this culture. And just because I'm inside it and just because I, you know, I, I, I'm not immune to it doesn't mean I don't see that we need structural change. I mean, we can actually hold contradictions. And what I see, and I, you know, I teach university, is I see a real shift in, in, in the 20-somethings I teach where 
they feel trapped by the by the not just the branding of the you know of corporations but the fact that they're told they need to be their own brand that they're constantly having to sort of perform their own selves on uh, on social media that they'll never get a job if they aren't a brand because of course no one has jobs anymore you just build your brand on social media and then monetize that um, and 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 I think they're much more critical of it than than my generation was because it's just it, 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 they have no respite from it. I mean, it, 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 the, your most intimate thoughts are part of the marketing of yourself. So I don't know. I think there's a, much more of a sense that this system you know, isn't just failing because the planet's getting warmer. It's failing because of the precariousness of work. It's failing because of just rampant um, hate online and just this sort of uh, multiple system failures. So... Yeah, I mean, I think I think there is it, there's no doubt people are still shopping, but there's a whole generation of people who are who are describing themselves as democratic socialists. This was a word people were afraid to use for decades, and now people are proudly saying that they're democratic socialists. Um, so I think there is a shift and and more of an appetite for structural change than certainly when I started writing about these issues. I mean, do you think fashion is one of the things that has to go? in the new world. When these companies started saying, we are selling a lifestyle, not a product. We are a lifestyle brand. It's about the idea. It's not about, the product is almost incidental. That was happening because so many of the ways in which people used to derive identity were under attack, under neoliberalism, um, were in decline. And so shopping became the way that people formed identity for, you know, it was your tribe. It was who, it was how you, con you constructed yourself. So you, you asked, is fast, you know, it's fast fashion going to have to go? Yeah, I mean, I think that the disposable lifestyle is not a sustainable lifestyle, whether it's a disposable approach to fashion or, or to food um, or to people. Um, but, I think, but I think that the real issue is we need to build up different ways for us to form that sense of belonging that isn't just about shopping. Um, and some people get that from a social movement. Some people get that from the communities they live in. But I think that shopping as, as a way of life, as the primary pastime, as, you know, what you do when you just can't think of anything else to do, um, I, I don't think it makes people particularly happy, which is amazing for capitalism because it means that, you know, that little jolt that you get just from buying something wears off and then you have to go buy something more to get that feeling again. So for capitalism, it works perfectly. It's a recipe for endless growth, um, but it's not a recipe for a happy life. It's not, it's, it's not a recipe for fulfillment. This is the other thing that people know is that there is an epidemic of, of depression, of loneliness, of addiction, um, and this is all happening simultaneously. So in changing in the face of the climate crisis, we actually have a chance to invest in those areas that actually do make us happier. I mean, we, we've touched on this question of sort of hypocrisy. I mean, th th this is one of the arguments that's going round and round in circles at the moment in, sure. in Britain again, you know, where every time an environmentalist is interviewed, you know, they're, they're, they're asked, you know, did you, did you get a taxi here? And do you have a television? And, you know, do you turn the lights on at home? Or yeah. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. I mean... What's the answer to those questions? The goal is always to sort of set a bar where you have to, like the world would have already had to change in order for, for you to be a non-hypocritical activist, right? Um, so what people are arguing for is structural change that's going to decarbonize our economy. We don't live in that world yet, so we all you know, some, some more than others, um, live lifestyles that are soaked in fossil fuels. So if you, it, it, if, if the, if you can't be an activist unless you have already somehow purged your whole life of fossil fuels, then you'll have an active, you'll have a movement of three people, which is great for the fossil fuel companies. Um, it's an incredibly effective way to repel activists, to make people afraid to participate because they don't want to be called a hypocrite. So I think people should just wear their hypocrisy proudly and just be like, yep, yeah, we're hypocrites, come on down, hypocrites, welcome, you know, because we need as big a movement as possible. That said, look, there's many things we should do uh, to lower our, our, our carbon footprint, and they, and, and they will, you know, make us healthier, too. You're healthier if you eat 
no meat or less meat. Um, you're healthier if you ride your bike and walk um, than if you're constantly, you know, in in a car. Um, these are all good, but they're not going to they're not going to cut global emissions in half in in 11 years. You need you need massive policy changes for that to happen. Yeah, I mean that, that's what you're saying in the book. The sort of the idea that sort of personal decisions are going to save the world um, must give way to systemic change. But well, I mean, you need both, don't you? In truth, because you know, as long as most of our emissions still come from our houses and our cars, yeah then th but those are things that we can do something about personally. We can, but, but, but we can also have policies that make those changes easier, right? That, that, that make it a lot easier for people to get solar panels on their, on their rooftops. You know, we can have charging stations that make electric cars a lot easier. Um, you know, I'm in favor of that. I used to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, and I didn't stop smoking because I suddenly realized it was bad for me. I knew it was bad for me. I stopped when you know, my government passed enough laws that it, I was turned into a social pariah. I, and, you know, I live in a cold climate and, and I, I, I had been banished from restaurants and bars and I was shivering outside um, because we had you know, we had regulatory uh, um, answers to to the epidemic of uh, of cancer. Uh, and and I decided, well, this really isn't worth it anymore. I'm freezing and alone outside smoking and I don't want to do that anymore. So. Yeah, we can make those changes, but we also need regulatory. We need regulations that make it easier for people to do that. Do you think most people now in the developed world believe in that climate change is real and want to do something about it, or do you think it's still a minority? Because you know, we, the, the right. facts. It, you know, the yeah. facts are that you know, across Europe and America and South America and India, people are electing right-wing populist governments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. They're not, they're not electing the kinds of people who want to do what you want to do. Right. Well, so the polling shows that most people do, yes, even in the United States, which has the strongest, st has, still has the strongest climate change denial rump. Um, for, uh, the majority of Americans believe climate change is happening, believe that humans are causing it, and there's been a huge shift just in the past year, and this is because of the wildfires and and this and this and these series of sort of staccato superstorms and flooding in the center of the, the country. Just enough Americans have been directly impacted, whether by coastal storms or inland flooding or wildfires on the West Coast, um, that people get it. They understand it's happening, and they, they feel a sense of urgency around it. But coming back to your question about the fact that these governments are right-wing governments are being elected, we have the kinds of climate policies that we have had um, over the past 15 years have mostly been market-based policies, right, which means that they have overwhelmingly popped pass the cost of climate action onto consumers. So people have come to associate climate action with the with the cost of living going up. And this is true in the UK too. Like, and, and some of it's true and some of it's right-wing messaging. Um, but the fact is that working people are dealing with job precarity. They're dealing with the cost of living increasing. They're dealing with a crazy housing market. They're dealing with many, many, many layers of stress. And so if you add on top of that, you have to deal with climate change by, deal, by paying more at the pump or more for electricity, people just can't do it. And so there's a backlash. And we saw it most dramatically in France with the Yellow Vest movement, with the Gilets Jaunes movement. And their slogan was to, to Macron, you care about the end of the world, we care about the end of the month. And that it is true that again and again, we have seen during times of economic stress, whatever momentum there is for doing something about climate change. And we can all remember, you know, a few years back in the UK, it was everyone was talking about it and then they stopped talking about it. What you see is that um, during times of economic stress, concern about climate change drops, right? Um, because it has been pit, like climate action has come to be associated with increasing your costs. So the point of a framework like the Green New Deal is it's saying, in dealing with climate change, we can create millions of well-paying unionized jobs. We can improve services so that we lessen the burden on working families. Um, and we can get the polluters to pay for it instead of just asking working people to foot the bill while they're seeing wealthy people get tax cuts and corporations get tax cuts and all of them stowing their money in offshore havens. So it's that's why it is so important that 
there be a just response to climate change, coming back to where we were, that what, you know, why it is so important to center justice. It isn't just because that, that's what the world I want looks like, where people are taken care of and where we heal some of the rifts, the wounds, the inequalities. If we don't make this transition fair, right? Fair to the workers, um, fair to, and fair in terms of who, who is paying for it and who is responsible for it, then there will be a backlash. I hope you don't mind me giving away sort of the end of the book because it's not a novel, <laughs> but I mean, you sort of, you end with a sort of a warning really about um, hopelessness mm. being the real problem. Um, you know, by far the biggest obstacle we were up against is hopelessness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A feeling that it's all just too big for us to, to cope with. H how hopeful are you as things stand? Yeah, so I wouldn't say I am full of hope. <laughs> the, the hopeful um, would imply that, I, that I'm just brimming with the stuff, right? Um, I have some hope. I also have grief, terror, rage at those responsible who knew and continue to dig us in deeper and deeper and deeper into this hole. Um, but I do have some hope because, as I said, there is a shift going on where we don't just have that outside pressure. We also have some people on the inside who are ready to translate that into policy. Um, a lot of things are in political flux right now. So there could be a new government in your country and mine pretty soon. Um, and, and, and so there is this pathway where we could change our society for the better, not just make it cleaner, but a lot fairer at the same time, not sequentially, at the same time, because that's the only way we're going to get either. Um, and so long as there's any hope of that happening, you know, even if it's just like a little tiny little sliver of a chance, that's all, like, I'm only interested in, in, in improving our chances of that happening, enlarging the, the, the possibility for hope, um, instead of just sort of figuring out, well, you know, if I were betting, you know, are, would I bet that that, that, that that would happen or that we're just going to, you know, collapse into eco-apartheid. You know, I think our ch chances of eco-apartheid are better than chances of a Green New Deal, but, th but that is such a horrific outcome that I just think we can't waste any time betting. We just have to try to improve our chances. So in your terms, I mean, you say it's possible we can have a change of government. It's, it's, it's also very possible, and, you know, the chances are pretty high that Boris Johnson gets another five years in Britain and Donald Trump gets another four years in America. Yeah, it'd be really next, bad. In the next 12 months. Right, so, so the only thing I if, care if about... If that happens, is, yeah. that, is that it? That it's all, 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 everything's a disaster and nothing's recoverable So in your 10-year timeline? Right now, to be honest with you, all I am doing is trying to figure out how, what I can do to prevent that outcome. Um, and from now until November 2020 in, in the U.S., that's going to be my, the focus of, my, uh, of all of my work. Um, and if, if we do end up with another term with Donald Trump, then it, no, there, there, there are always things that we can do. Um, and we will do them. You know, I think this idea that you just kind of give up, you know, I don't think it's even a question that most people on the planet can even entertain. I mean, most people are just fighting to survive. And every fraction of a degree of warming that we can prevent is an improvement. So we'll have to fight for that. But like I said, between now and November 2020, I'm going to be working to do everything possible for there to be a candidate that can beat Donald Trump running on a Green New Deal that they start rolling out on day one. I mean, just on that, I mean, do you have a candidate in mind? Um, you know, I think... Because that's one of the great mysteries yeah. as to why the Democrats still haven't got one. <laughs> <laughs> it's an absolutely terrible process. Um, you know, I think, for, to be frank with you, my first priority right now is that it really can't be Biden. Um, and that is mainly because I think Biden is a very, well, first of all, he's the only candidate, the leading candidate who hasn't endorsed a Green New Deal. He went with Obama, you know, as vice president, their administration pushed a massive expansion of natural gas. Um, they did some good things, but they did more bad things, to be honest, when it can't, comes to, 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 to climate. Um, so he's not trustworthy in, in my view. Um, but I also, do, I also really think that he, he 
would be a very poor candidate running against Donald Trump. And and I think the Ukraine scandal makes that clear why. Um, you know, w- one of the areas where Trump is most vulnerable, where you really need a candidate who can go after him hard, is the way his own family has profited off of the presidency. And there's lots of dirt there to go after him. And I think Bernie Sanders could go after him hard on that. I think Elizabeth Warren could go after him hard on that. But obviously, Joe Biden can't, because even if what happened in Ukraine is legal, it's pretty unseemly that his son was paid $50,000 a month to be on the board of a fossil fuel company um, because his last name was Biden while his father was vice president. It's the kind of self-dealing that we need to go after Trump for because his kids are busily profiting off of the Trump name all around the world right now and the fact that their father is president. So we need somebody who's not who doesn't have their hands tied behind their back because of their own scandals and their own compromises. And so, yeah, I mean, for me personally, I think when it comes to the Green New Deal, Bernie's plan is better. Bernie's plan is, is much more ambitious. It's 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 also a lot um, it's just a lot better internationally. Bernie's the only candidate who's talking about cutting military spending to pay for the Green New Deal, which I think is really key. Um, and he's also talking about ponying up a lot of money, $200 billion, um, to help poorer countries to leapfrog to clean uh, tech um, and to protect their forests and to deal with the impacts of climate change. Um, we, we have also, you know, I think he's better on my, he's good on migration and linking it to, to migrant rights. So yeah, I, I, I support Bernie, um, but I'd be, I'd be happy with Warren. This whole conversation has been about changing the world and <laughs> fundamentally changing the world. So this is a slightly unfair question, but I mean, um, you know, I don't know whether you do it in pieces or whether you have to do it all the, in one go, but if I give you a magic wand and say, change the world, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, my son is so into magic wands right now. Um, I think what I, the, what I would do is every, every government policy and every corporate policy would have to be subject to a carbon audit. Um, and if that policy um, was not compatible with our rapidly diminishing carbon budget to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, it simply could not happen. So all, all policies would have to be subject to our carbon budget. A new rule. A new for, rule. For all governments. Yeah, it all has to be audited. Yeah, a carbon audit for every policy. Naomi Klein, thank you very much indeed thank for you. joining us and for sharing your ways to change the world. I hope you enjoyed that. It was a pleasure. Um, I hope you enjoyed that as well. And if you did, then please do give us a, a rating or a review. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer today is Rachel Evans. Until next time, bye-bye.